I'm Matt Kelly. And I'm Matt Dancona. And this is the two mats for the week ending Friday, the 7th of July. Uh, and we're both here to give a new European view of the week's events in politics and a bit of culture as well. Very much so. And a big welcome to our listeners. Thank you, by the way. Thank to you. To all of you who've tuned in. Big because thank you. I was really happy to see us feature in the podcast charts. Yeah, we are the wham of podcasting. With, I don't think wham were that successful straight off the hoof. No, they weren't. Uh, they were kids. You just, know? Yeah, they were just yeah. kids. They could only... Only hope They're going to scratch su- the surface. Only hope for success you know, like this. Yeah, wake me up before you go, go. Oh, <laughs> well, let's hope they've not gone gone already. No, no, no. So, Matt, what did we talk about this week that people are about to listen to? We hope. We talked about the minuscule status, both physically and politically, of Mr. Rishi Sunak. Yeah. Uh, and how the party is being engulfed by very strange nationalists yeah. who are easy to mock but actually it's it's a worrying trend in conservatism yeah. how so the sorts of tectonic plates of the it, Tory a, party it's are becoming moving. a party of identity yeah. not yeah. the economy and we also talked about social media Mark Zuckerberg's challenge to Elon Musk's Twitter yeah and um, we discussed Musk mocking Zuckerberg mm. and talking about the false happiness of Hide the pain. Hide the pain. I'd make a good. Uh, Hide the pain. Make a good title for the show. So this is the two mats episode three. Hide the pain. Hide the pain. So Matt, what do you want to talk about this week? Well, I I I love the cover piece this in this week of the new european, european uh, the Giles very Wolves. kind of you to say so well you know i mean uh, partly i'm paid to say so of <laughs> course, so let's let's be let's it be quite upfront about this you know full, contract of employment it would if i'd said god you know, what, are you, shit, what are you thinking it? man uh no i loved it and i thought it was very incisive and in and, and, and intuitive about what's gone wrong with yeah. Rishi because we should explain to the to the handful I'm sure the handful of the listeners diminishing who, haven't, number. who haven't subscribed yet Shamed. to the new European that it's a a photograph uh, of a of a big desk with a big telephone and a big flag except they're not really they're just normal size but a very yes. very small Rishi Sunak yes. beneath the headline Little Britain and how Rishi has diminished the UK Giles nails it which is to link it into the 1980s, which I think yeah. is a really intelligent way of doing it, because the thing that has always struck me as the kind of most telling thing about Rishi Sunak is that when he was at the Treasury as Chancellor of the Exchequer, he had behind his desk a picture of Nigel Lawson. Yes. Which is very odd when you think about it, because Nigel yeah. Lawson was uh, Chancellor in the you know mid to late 80s, which is a long time ago. That's right. And, and, and not your natural pin-up material. <laughs> It speaks to the actually one of the the worst problems the Tory party suffers from, which is the notion of the unfinished Thatcher revolution. Yeah. And he, Sunak, is a absolute example of that. And I think that's one of the reasons why what we're witnessing at the moment is not just the sort of decline and fall of the post-Brexit Conservative Party, but the end of a kind of imperial period that began in 1979 and is now... I think, drawing to a close. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Giles really sort of nailed it and how Sunak has a sort of series of beliefs about growth and so on, which are, you know, totally have their roots in the um, yeah. in the 80s. But what he doesn't understand is that the 2020s are totally different. And, and well, that was the most depressing part of the piece, really. And, it, you know, there's no getting around from it. It, it was a depressing read because... What he was saying, he said, you can draw comparisons with the 80s, if you like, you know, and, mm. and in many ways, you know, where we live now and at the time we live now is immeasurably superior to living in the 80s when yes. lots of things were very miserable, high unemployment, you know, a sense of kind of real malaise and none of the sort of and, and, and massive dysfunction between geographies, yes. regions in the country. You know, you talk no, about awful. levelling yeah, up no. now. I mean, it was... Go, step back in time and... and No-go you know, zones for... Poli- we're we're literally kind of talking yeah. about a period of time when the Conservative government was talking about running Liverpool down, for instance, just closing... Close to social it, segregation, you know. it, really. Yeah. So, um, so, he, so he makes the point that actually our standard of life and the way of life we've got now is immeasurably better than it was in the 80s. But... The good thing about the 80s, from one small perspective, was that there was a sense of purpose and ambition to yeah. all the pain. No, definitely. That the, you know, whatever you think of Thatcher, and I've got very strong views about Thatcher, 
But whatever you think about it, at least she had a vision that this is going to be very painful, but it's going to get us to a place yes. of growth. And and the comparison with today is that this is going to be bloody painful and it's just going to be painful and it's not getting us anywhere. It's yes. just to pay for the mistakes that yeah. we've been accounting. You the, know. There is there's the, the, ter- the, the best that they can offer is maybe we'll bring inflation down eventually. Yeah, um, well, I mean, this is a... one of his five key pledges, isn't it? Yes, it the is. Halve inflation. What was the inflation rate when he was talking about halving it? Was, it was about 10, and so yeah. it's got to be down. To, uh, if he's going to meet his target, it's got to be down to five-ish r- yeah. by Christmas, which he's not going to And it's not going to happen. No. And the other thing that I that I was really struck, which I thought was a very clever point to make by Giles, was when Rishi Sunak said, we've just got to tough it out, we've got to hold our nerve, Giles asked the question, who was he talking to? Who was the yes. we in that? And he concluded that the we in that sentence was not, the great British population. Yes. It was the Conservative Party. It was specifically the Parliamentary Conservative Party. Yeah. When he said, we've got to hold our nerve, he was talking to his backbenchers, yes. saying, we're going to get through this. We're going to come out the other side because it's impossible to reconcile with any logic that sentence, you've got to hold your nerve, with the utter lack of ambition that these these measures are are going to achieve yeah. and and the immediate impact that they're having on people's lives as, as you've just described you know people are really suffering out there and it, there's middle class economic insecurity yeah. to an extent that wasn't in the 80s yeah. as well which is new i mean on the parliamentary party and and the party sunak took over last year i mean the best measurement of how he's failed as a leader of, of a party is that that party is now basically fragmenting and we saw this week the launch of the new conservatives um which reminded me of that old song you know everything old is new again i mean they're they're new but they are they are very reactionary yeah um and they brought in this term which is a euphemism which is cultural insecurity yeah they want their obsession is driving down immigration but what was interesting was they launched this 12 point uh immigration plan Um, which included things like no recruitment of care workers from overseas. Now, there are about 165 vacancies in the care sector. It's broken, right? 165,000. It's 165,000, sorry. And so to actually say no recruitment is is insanity. And also uh, then they want to make it more difficult for the best and the brightest from abroad who come over here to study to stay, Mm. you know, in the middle of a massive tech yeah. revolution where we want those people to That's stay right. you know and and participate in in that mm. um but what's really interesting about that i think is you see the conservative party which used to be predominantly a party about economics becoming predominantly a party about culture and identity yeah did you read that david aranovich piece in the in prospect this very good this piece. month yeah, very about good piece. and that was his visit to that conference they had the NAC NACCONS, Con, the yeah. National, National Conservatives and you know he was, he was on the money he was talking about a group of people who were presenting a picture of Britain that bears no resemblance to reality you know they're talking about a Britain lost in sort of cultural mar- Marxism and narcissism and all, all of this people are just out there trying to get on with their lives you know they're not yeah. in this rabbit hole of, of kind of demented right wing populism and and what, what I also thought was interesting about that piece was he made the point that they draft in people from, uh, you know, Trump MAGA people from the, from America, and and and, and they lots of them as and well. lots of them, and all of these think tank people, and then these sort of dimwits on, you know, GB News and that, you know, Darren Grimes and Toby Young and all that ilk, and and as an ensemble, they sit there in this conference hall and present a picture of Britain that is absolutely absurd. But they all believe they all feed off their own kind of they they, they fumes, do and you know. and the, there's a weirdness to it which is it's actually a very old fashioned view which is this belief in essentially an economic self sufficiency or as the Nazis called it autarky you know yeah, yeah. Um, and and the idea that you can be economically self sufficient yeah. in in the 21st century yeah. is is hilarious it's actually yeah. not worth taking seriously but they believe that they think that the answer is stop the immigrants coming in yeah. and upskill people to do the work that they're coming here to do and it would all be so laughable and entertaining if it wasn't for the fact that these people are now having a gravitational effect on 
the direction of the Conservative Party in general. Totally. I mean, they are. There's no doubt that the post Sunak party is going to be a variety of Brexit populist nativism. Now, yeah. it might be more at the Kemi Badnock, uh, Steve Baker. I can't believe I'm describing Steve Baker at the moderate end of. Yeah. Um, well, he's had his conversion. Hasn't he's he? had his conversion, yeah. uh, but the, you know they are. You know he disowned he disowned Swella Braverman, the Home Secretary, the other day. For it was reported for her absolutely, you know, inaccurate labelling of uh, the Pakistani community is responsible for most grooming, which is just yeah. a lie. Yeah. So Baker's distanced himself from Swella Braverman. So the, there's the bad, not brave. Baker end of the Brexit nativist yes. world, and then you've got the full on, yeah. you know, the crankies. You've got the the National Conservatives who are just getting with the these new Conservatives, yeah. including one might note Lee Anderson, <laughs> who's deputy Lee, right? But he's deputy chair of That's the right. party. That's right. His job is to get. Rishi re-elected. That's his. That's yeah. his job. Yeah. And yet, I mean, he stayed away from the launch on Monday. Yeah. But you know, he's part. He's he's front and center. And you know, I think Danny Kruger is the the notional leader yeah. of of the New Conservatives. But Lee Anderson is the sort of engine behind it all. Meanwhile, um, it's worth mentioning. I mean, just talking about what's okay. We're already thinking. I, I think. Well, I know the Conservative Party's thinking anyway about the post-Rishi era. Um, We should bring in the fourth, Matt, because there's us, our glorious producer, Matt Hill, and in the manner of the Cambridge spy ring, the fourth, Matt, (laughs) who I don't think would necessarily like to be included with our number. Graham Green. Graham Green, exactly. The third man and the The fourth, Matt. The third, Matt, exactly. Um, Matthew Goodwin, um, who wrote a book earlier this year, published a book earlier this year, called Values, Voice and Virtue, which actually was the subject of my first column for the New European. It was. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Goodwin, um, which posited that Britain is being overtaken by evil liberal elites and everything and uh, woke blobs and, yeah. you know, you know the story, which is ironic, really, because, I mean, actually it's being run by a Brexit lead. But this week he did a um, a kind of... Very strange for a notional academic. He did a kind of, um, you know, call to arms. Yeah. Um, shall, we, shall we listen to it? Go bit for of it, it, play it, yeah. I'm talking about a political economy which is completely broken. We no longer really own anything. We no longer really make anything. And we no longer prioritise British workers. I'm talking about what we're teaching our children in schools about race, sex and gender exposing them to ideas which often have no serious basis in science. I'm talking about the fact that Britain now has some of the highest rates of family breakdown in the Western world, and nobody seems to care. Why is this happening? It's happening because the people who run Britain no longer care about the rest of Britain. They're reshaping the country, they're reshaping its institutions, around a small university educated minority who simply don't share the values and the concerns of the rest of the country. They also look down on the rest of the country. I know that because I've been in rooms with them. I've been a university professor for more than 20 years. I know how this new elite think and feel and what they believe. And I've become convinced that millions of people out there think the same as me. That's enough of you, fourth map. So that is, I find that all a bit depressing, you know, and just well, just depressing. I mean, yeah. doesn't it make you want yeah. to throw something at the laptop? I mean, it's I'll throw something at him. At him. Yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 an extraordinary word salad. Yeah. Because basically, he's just brought together a whole bunch of ideas and thrown them into one kind yeah. of speech. And he talks about the people who run Britain. Um, as far as I'm aware, the people who run Britain have been the Conservative Party yeah, um, yeah. for quite a while now. And and yet what he really means is, and it's a bit vague, a bit, bit nebulous, is, you know, universities, the BBC, the media, you know. Yeah. And th- there's a slightly sinister edge to that because it's, it's as, all, as with all conspiracy theories, it's never quite spelt out, but it's meant to trigger resentment. 
Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that, that I've got two complaints about it in large. One, it was really craply written, you know. So go back. Three out of ten must do better, right? Yes. But secondly, this idea, this recurring theme, which we'll come to over and over again about they won't let you say that. You can't say what you really think. He says saying it. He says saying it to an audience of millions. Uh, Richard Littlejohn says saying it to an audience of millions every week. You know, Kelvin McKenzie, all of these guys on talk TV, you know, GB News, all complaining about the, the lack of platform for people saying exactly what they are currently saying. As they say it. Shut up. Yes. Shut up. You're saying it. It's just that a lot of people think you're talking bollocks. That's all. Being having having the right to say something, and having the right to impose that view on a population are two very different things indeed. And one is called free speech, and the other is called authoritarianism. Mm. And what they want is authoritarianism. When exactly. actually, when they say you can't say it, you can't say it these days. What they mean is there's too many other people saying what they aren't saying. Yeah. So shut up, please, lefty whing- whinging liberals. I, I thought I thought that his um his uh, sentence which began I'm convinced that uh, yeah. was doing a lot of work yeah. I, I, mean, I wonder what Mark he'd give that by the way in someone's in thesis in someone's essay exactly oh, I think uh, yeah based on absolutely zero evidence whatsoever I think everyone agrees with me I've come to feel like this I'm increasingly convinced that what I think is what everyone thinks it's like sure Trump's uh, people are saying yeah which often That's right, you yeah. just knew was going to begin a sentence that was yeah. not the case yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think he's I mean he is uh, he's someone who's a very interesting case of is like a an anthropologist that goes native because he started writing about national populism uh, and it's quite interesting actually because mm. it was early and UKIP was starting and he spotted that and he wrote about it and, and you know he was sympathetic but you could tell that what he was writing was sort of it was useful and informative yeah but he's gone native and he yeah. believes all this so there's this kind of strange Mosleyite yeah. aura to him now, yeah. which is he obviously wants to. Well, that isn't that the other weird thing about? Sorry to to group people like Matthew Goodwin in with people like Nigel Farage and Jacob Eastman, but they all seem to get this sense of personal self deification where they yeah. they they rise to the front of the national march and they say, "Here is leadership. Follow yes. my flag. Yeah. I will resolve your issues." You know, there's something very, you know narcissistic about about the whole delivery of that message i feel with a lot of these people it's narcissistic and it's also dangerous because you saw um the express this week um saying i didn't because i never look at it but well it was on the bbc it it was on the bbc (laughs) press preview so i saw saw it there saying something to the effect of stop the people you know stop the courts uh obstructing the people's will (laughs) well this invocation of the people yeah I mean, it has an inglorious history. Well, it really does. I mean, recently with the Daily Mail, you know, enemies oh, totally. of the people enemies and of all the people. Of this business. And it's dangerous because it undermines the rule of law. It undermines trusted institution. There's a reason we have, you know, judges separate yeah. from politicians. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't go the way they want it, the way it didn't go right for them yeah. over Rwanda. And it might go right for them in the Supreme Court. It was good of the Express to fit that in between the Brexit is working people. Yes, splashes, it, Brexit is working, although it's been completely thwarted. Yes. You know, <laughs> but uh, the other thing is that there, there, there's, there's a there's a there's a strange paradox because the people you mentioned, like Farage and Rhys Mogg and, and indeed Professor Goodwin, the yeah. fourth man, they love to pump themselves up as sort of charismatic leaders who are ready to, you know, take on the burden of of national le- uh, leadership. But they're also fantastic snowflakes. Yeah. You yes. know, they love victimhood. You know, Farage with his bank account, which yeah. turned out to be not yeah. what he'd said at all. Um, and there's Prof Goodwin on Twitter telling anyone who wants to listen yeah. about how Britain is run by... Alastair Campbell, Emily Maitlis, if and only. some yeah. yoga instructors or, or whatever, <laughs> whoever is the latest yeah. evil group. Yeah. I mean, you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg is very good in, on the sort of, um, not very good, but, you know, he, he does a lot on the kind of stab in the back, mm. you know, that that if only Boris Johnson had been stabbed in the back by the kangaroo court. That's of the right. Privileges. Now, it's funny, but there are, this, this is a dangerous game to play. Yeah. Because I mean, people say dog whistle. These aren't dog whistles. They're not. They're, they're foghorns to people. We are way beyond you know? dog yeah, whistles. Yeah. Um, and there is, and we should say that there is, you know, 
a large constituency of people out there who are listening to that and nodding vigorously absolutely, along to it. And, and they're not going anywhere, those people. No, not so at all. this is the problem, wasn't it, with, with Brexit? That and, and, and for years after Brexit, if we're honest, is that the two camps were so distinct and so at odds that not enough effort was taken to try and understand and empathise and cajole or, you know, change your own views, compromise and try and come together and find some common ground. You know, maybe the next battlefield is going to be this, you know, intense right wing nationalism coming back in a new mutating out of the remnants of this yes. weak prime minister's conservative party and it will rise up into something even nastier than we've seen right now yeah. and but we have seen in other countries like in france no, totally. and 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 in america obviously america. notably you know and emerging with afd in in germany yeah. increasingly it, it, so we've got to be the I, I think we carry and when i say we i'm talking about people who consider themselves maybe centrists yeah. you know or, or certainly against right wing nationalism yeah. we think that that a harder version of that has gone away forever but it can it can resurface anytime no i mean the 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 the, the daftest idea that i hear and have heard for actually decades now is the idea of the pendulum in politics there is no pendulum in politics uh, oddly enough I hear a lot of business people saying be all right after the election because the tory party will pull itself together and uh, the pendulum will swing back to one nation centrism. Well, uh, it's always good to hear that, you know, the, the, the more parties in the field that are sane, the better. But what the answer they never have is who exactly? Mm. Because Boris Johnson purged them all in 2019. Mm. There is no identifiable one nation candidate and there certainly isn't a taste for it either in the parliamentary party that's going to be or the membership at large, they're not going to get a One Nation leader after the election. Okay, well, great point to leave it. I'm sure we'll pick that up again. Uh, Come back and join us after the break. So, Matt, what else on the agenda this week? As you know, I, I lead a crazy and wacky life. You do. But in reality... You consume, let me just say, you consume more media than any individual I've ever encountered. I, I, I've i never thrown anything at you that you haven't already said, yeah, yeah, I've read that or I've seen that. But have you also seen... Yeah. Do, 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 do. The brackets it's, has no social life. Well, obviously, <laughs> are you, you, must, you must be just like on okay, so- mad sleepless nights watching everything listening to everything it, it, i mean what can i say uh you've, <laughs> you've I'm other than busted um so uh last night uh we're recording this on yeah. thursday i must confess that i got back from a very pleasant dinner and I, and instead of just going to bed like a normal person thinking, oh, that was nice um i thought oh wow the new mark zuckerberg meta yeah. Uh, social network threads is going live at, yeah. at midnight so being an idiot i stayed up and joined it right and watched it and uh, i have to say that it wasn't until you put it like that that i now fully reflect <laughs> upon the weirdness of it yeah. but just to give some of the background um we all know that elon musk's takeover of twitter has not worked very well and there's a great piece by james ball in yeah. the, in the current new european about yeah. about that and Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk um, are frenemies, I think, verging now towards enemies. And uh, Zuckerberg has, has long wanted to do a, a kind of rival to Twitter. Yeah. yeah. And Threads is it. Shall, I mean, shall I tell you what my brief so yes, far? Yes, please. Well, my, my view on Twitter is that the problem with Twitter is is also what has made it work, which is that... Of course, it's toxic and poisonous and horrible, but it appeals to the lizard brain. Mm-hmm. OK, uh, whereas Instagram is us being nice, you know, oh, look at my lasagna. Right. Yeah, or, yeah, you know, yeah. celebrating our children. It's the nice side of us. Okay? Yeah, it's, um, that's right. No one gets into huge. No, you, there are no on Instagram, Instagram rows, right, you know, right. the, and people who are on Twitter, you know, very, very in, inclined to be sort of angry. And, yeah. you know, and, and I know from personal ch- experience, ch- much angrier than I mean, it's like your top your angriest three percent of your moments in life is 100 percent of, of your time. Course. On Twitter. Totally. No, no. I mean, um, when my when my late father was still alive, he would say to me, 
um, if I had no United, said, uh, off to have a fight on Twitter, yeah. are you? You know, it's, <laughs> and, and he was always right. Um, yeah. So there is something about Twitter that is obviously, you know, by definition adversarial, not least yeah. because the algorithms encourage that. Now, Threads, um, Zuckerberg posted on Threads today, Thursday, saying, we're definitely focusing on kindness and making this a friendly place. That was uh, that could have been. He's in the room. I know. And Close your eyes, uh, listeners. He's in the room. And Musk, Musk had already tweeted on Twitter, it's uh, um, infinitely uh, preferable to be attacked by uh, strangers on Twitter than uh, to indulge in the false happiness of hide the pain Instagram. <laughs> right now, hide the pain Instagram. I think is one of my new favourite phrases. So I'm expecting the T-shirt any day. Yeah, so. hide the pain Instagram. Hide the pain Instagram. So what we've got here is two competing views of how to do the public square. Yeah, and that's actually it's funny. Yeah. And it's even funnier because, as as we've you know laughed about before, they they are notionally at least going to have a mixed martial arts Be fantastic. contest in Can't the wait. in the octagon. I'm at, going. At if Las they Vegas. Do. We should go because yeah. I mean they have spoken to Dana White, the supremo yeah. of the UFC, yeah. about it. So it's not it's not totally ridiculous it would just be like it would just be the best ever because just a bit of slap well pop zuckerberg knows what he's doing he does he? i mean he's a jujitsu so, expert and he's in very good shape he's 39 a couple of slaps and i think elon would just be on the floor asking where and it, it all doesn't went wrong. take much no you know no. i mean he'd be on the ground saying uh so uh, why are you uh, trying to attack me with your hands and also your feet you know <laughs> and i think zuckerberg because of course the the the, the 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 normal dynamic is that everyone goes, oh, I'm not Zuckerberg, nice, yeah, you know. Yeah. And Elon Musk is evil, the Bond villain, and yeah. you know. But I, I think in the ring, yeah, we see. Although it. I'd sooner have dinner with Elon Musk than Zuckerberg, wouldn't you? Yeah, totally. Yeah. No, no, totally. Because I mean, any day of the week. I mean, I think the problem Elon Musk has had all along is that he's an engineer. Yeah. Um, and he thought that he could bring to Twitter the logic that has made him successful with Tesla and, you know, to some extent with SpaceX. They're both very, um, you know, lucrative businesses. Apart from as, as well as apart from there, well, an impre- you know, impressive, and impre- impressive entrepreneurial in, in any any bond's book. But, yeah. but Twitter is a, you know, it's 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 crazy town. I mean, you yeah. know, it's not an engineering no. uh, project, and I think it baffled him because he likes trolling. So I think he thought he would be the kind of jolly master yeah. of ceremonies, you know, and hurl chaos into. Did he call himself Chief Twitter? Or something yeah, like that and, and, and yeah, yeah. you know, he's he's had to resile from that and mm. um, brought on a new chief executive, Linda Yaccarino, who's yeah. got a background in advertising, and he hasn't really nailed the business model. So, so well, this is this is where I think Zuckerberg's got a chance, and maybe we disagree on this. We'll we'll find out in a minute. But speaking as the owner of a business that has a Twitter account, the New European, yeah, and we've got 130,000 followers or something like this. They're now asking us to pay, I think it's 1,100 quid a month for one of their ticks. Yeah. And now if you can't, if you don't have one of the ticks, there are certain things you can't do. So it's it's becoming increasingly less useful to us as a business. And yeah. there's just no way it's worth 1,100 no, quid a month anyway. So... You know, I'm now, I've been asking myself, why are we on Twitter in the first place? You know, and there must be lots of people thinking this. You know, it's not always good for your brand or reputation. It's becoming increasingly expensive. And it's a time cost as well. You could be doing other things on other platforms that might have greater benefits. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I was very surprised he made that elementary mistake. And I thought, uh oh, uh, this is this not all go well for Musk's custody of tweet of Twitter because. Um, the blue tick it was, as envisaged in the Jack Dorsey era of Twitter, was was a useful thing, which was, you know, there were so many people pretending to be well-known people, often politicians, that it was a verification thing. Yeah. And you need that, actually, because, yeah. you know, if you're talking about um, Rishi Sunak or Keir Starmer or Donald Trump or... Joe Biden, or you know, there are going to be hundreds of imposters. Yeah, I mean, there's an imposter, Billy Brat. I mean, there are yeah. all, all sorts of things, and they're all verified now. Uh, well, because they're paying the idea that you can buy yeah. verification yeah. is ridiculous. Now, there was a embedded in that there was a potentially smart idea, which is subscription is better than advertising because the Twitter model and what drove some of the toxicity was algorithms sort of cluster around clickbait 
and that drives advertising. And the things that get more advertising are yeah. the, are the things that are more you know sort of wild. Whereas a subscription model, to some extent, would would perhaps have calmed that a little but he he muddled two completely separate things so one of the things i find very difficult on twitter now is i really don't know whether this um a tweet by a notion notionally from a famous politician is from a famous politician yeah, you have to and, go and check it and you have to go and know, check it and, and that, it see that how many followers they've got just sort of in the yeah. day the day-to-day -day business of journalism is a is, is a pain yeah, yeah. so if if the, the the area where i think zuckerberg might score is I don't believe he's going to turn the public square into a kind of uh, milk and honey um, kumbaya place. I think that's impossible. Um, but if he was able to give restore some authority to social networks, that's you know prose based social networks. That's interesting. He yeah. Might. Well, I mean, and also, so you know, is Threads the place where you can go and have a row with the people that you're being nice to on Instagram. If you it's, want to go and have a row with them on well, threads. Well, I, I, you know. I think the interesting thing is exactly that, which is the, the intimacy of its link to Instagram is fascinating because mm. Instagram has 2 billion followers. And clearly, Zuckerberg is thinking, we're not getting as much juice out of them as we yeah. could yeah. on Nicegram. You know, Nicegram is where you go to say nice things, right? We all do. Yeah, And I'm not saying that Threads will be as a sort of poisonous and adversarial as Twitter, but he's obviously thought that I could get more. So the first thing when you when you sign up to Threads is they just import all your That's right. Instagram contacts, so it's intimately connected. One of the questions that will arise out of this, I think, is it you know how powerful can Mark Zuckerberg get because yeah. he now has potentially a significant social network yeah well facebook instagram he has threads. facebook yeah. instagram whatsapp yeah whatsapp of course yeah. i mean that you yeah. no one yeah. in the world has if, had that if threads yeah. works yeah no one ever will have had as much control over that's right public discourse i mean it makes literally anything. makes murdoch look like a guy on a soapbox in I mean, hyde park corner you know you know M yeah. murdoch is marginal it's marginal yeah. um here's a big question for you right put all these billionaires to one side would the world be a better place without social media if it never existed? No, because um, for all its horror, sh horror show, and and some of it is horror show, um, a lot of it is horror show, it has enabled people to form connections mm -hmm. on a professional, uh, entrepreneurial, intellectual level. The bits of Twitter that, to be honest, journalists don't <laughs> often visit, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's been hugely important in uh, you know it, it was important in the arab spring it, it's important yeah. now in ukraine movement, movements movements yeah. you know it's me like too. you know Black me, Lives me Matter. too it's yeah. like you yeah. know yeah. how do you connect yeah how do you get the world to know yeah as they're getting bored of the ukraine conflict that actually there is still huge suffering in mariupol or kiev yeah. or whatever a twitter is a very useful but um, again against that is and, and I, but you know, I kind of agree with that assessment that generally it's it's social media in general is a force for good, but I don't think there's any doubt that it's made a huge number of people angrier, yes. less happy, oh. less content. You know, yeah. e even to the extent that, you know, to touch on Elon Musk's point about you know ignore the pain or hide the pain. You know, seeing this constant presentation of people's lives as being something joyful and wonderful, you know, and and trying to reconcile that with the grim reality of your own life, yeah. and then engaging in the same lie about your own life being nothing but a procession of wonderful moments, you yes. know, it 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 has, I think, changed so uh, society yeah. significantly, but almost without us noticing. Uh, and I I do think there's a there's a brought a kind of chronic um downside to social media yes. that is a it is mitigated by the kind of big important things it enables but I, I would reckon there's a lot of people who are less happy today than they were 20 years ago because of social media there is a lot of uh a lot of damage has been done yeah. to to the whole political process by yeah. social media uh, no doubt about that yeah. and um you know i think it's fair to say, actually, that probably Brexit wouldn't have happened without social media. This is very right. contentious. A lot of people say, no, 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 you know, it would. But the targeting of advertising, yeah. where you could have 
uh, vote leave or leave EU saying simultaneously, for instance, um, if you vote Brexit, we'll be able to really protect animal rights. Yeah. Or if you vote Brexit, we'll finally be able to restore fox hunting. Yes. Just to take two yeah. completely you know, yeah, yeah. random examples. And I think that... Um, and targeting very distinct yes, audiences. and it's yeah. very hard to yeah. get hold of those adverts. You yeah. know, the, 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 the micro-targeting is very difficult to track. So James Ball makes this point very well, I think, which is that 2024 is probably going to be a huge year for elections in the UK, on the continent, and finally in November in, um, in the US. And these social media networks we have are not up to the task. Yeah. And I'd certainly agree with him on that. Yeah, no, me too. Okay. So what have we talked about this week? Well, uh, a bit of culture. I mean, we've talked about mm. culture in a kind of dead serious way. Yeah. But um, I've had a fun week just in um, the sort of retro culture. Yeah, I know you have, yeah. I saw the restored Ziggy Stardust uh-huh. uh, movie, uh, and it was on the 50th anniversary of yeah. the show at Hammersmith. And it's beautifully restored, and uh, it was wonderful to watch. And you know, uh, it's not particularly original or incisive to observe that he was a genius. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I've seen the, I've seen, I've seen the, original. the old, the original yes. many times. Yeah. How, how is this the, more effective or the, different? Uh, they've really, really gone to work. It's four K on on screen, right? Uh, and they've really gone to work on the quality. Right. And then for the real shadows amongst us, myself included. Um, They've restored the Jeff Beck footage, which for some uh-huh. reason was not in the original. Right. Okay. So cool. if that's the kind of thing you get excited about, which Very it is, cool. am I right? The other thing um, which I watched, um, which again, it, the power of retro pop never ceases to amaze me, is Netflix has just uh, dropped a, a documentary about Wham. Mm. And... You know, if you told me when I was buying those records in the early 80s that 2023 would be a documentary about that very short four years where George Michael and Andrew Ridgely owned yeah. pop music, I'd have been slightly puzzled because I, I love those records, but I th- I'd have thought by then. Yeah. It's a great documentary. Fantastic. Ridgely's, you know, very impressive, very eloquent. Yeah. It's quite triste because it's about the end of a friendship. And, no, of course. And, of course, yeah. the it leads you know no spoilers it leads uh, though it's not dealt with in this documentary to the the sort of george michael's emergence Unraveling as a, a massive world superstar and then yeah. sad decline yeah. but it but it is but it is it, it fascinates me that pop music which started off as a sort of mayfly yeah uh idiom you know that was kind of here here and gone tomorrow yeah. has become actually That's like the classics yeah. you know well have you ever been, have you seen uh, been to abba voyage not yet i mate honestly uh, Alistair one, Campbell tells me it's like well, he's been several times. I, I, I will go. I will. A, I, uh, so for context, I remember the first cassette I ever got given was when I, it was Abba's Greatest Hits Volume Abba Gold 2. Or, or, uh, no, 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 it was, it was like, before Gold. It was well before Gold. This would, I'd have been about eight years old, oh, I okay. guess, something like this. So it would have been 77, 78, something like that. I remember my granny parking in Waterloo Road in Crosby. There was a record shop in Crosby going in and seeing this on the wall. I can remember it like yesterday. No. And with the grey cover and buying it and listening to Abba. And I've always loved Abba. You know, oh, Abba, brilliant. Fantastic. Perfect pop. Mate, when you go and see this, I don't want to sound like a PR man for Abba Voyage, but it is something else. I mean, it, they are there. Yeah. They're there in front of you. They're not holograms. They're people. Yeah. You know, there's one very weird moment, and it's for a second where one of the women backs up as she's dancing and you can see her backside sort of buffers a bit it's kind of pixelates and it's that but i i only mentioned that to to tell you just how how disturbing that is within what you're actually seeing and there's a live band playing to the side and the auditorium's amazing and i think the auditorium is kind of portable so it can collapse and get taken to other cities but if you if you uh, if you're of our age and you're an abba fan definitely try i will definitely see see it i mean the hologram thing is amazing and uh, just to add to our cultural, yeah, uh, you've, had a big week. you've had a big week. And well, so ongoing. I saw Jarvis Cocker Amazing. at Finsbury Park. Uh, top marks to Jarvis Cocker, less marks to Finsbury Park as a venue. You had really? to queue for about an hour and ten minutes for a beer. It was awful. Hackney Council, get your act together. It was yeah, terrible. pull your pull your finger out. Yeah, uh, but also tonight I'm going to see the, the boss. boss. 
At where Hyde you Park. Him? Hyde oh. Park. Yeah. I gather I mean, the So set. I've never seen him live and I'm a I saw him at Glastow a bunch yeah. of years ago and he was absolutely amazing. Yeah. And people who've seen him recently tell yeah. me that he's in storming form. This is Bruce Springsteen in case people don't know who the boss is. The boss, but, yes. Yeah. But yeah. It's complicated because of course Matt Kelly is the boss. I the am new the Euro, boss. The new Bruce Springsteen but is and the, boss. The, 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 <laughs> the big, big boss. It's, yeah. I mean he is kind of He's yeah. the person, in a way, who, um, more than anyone in pop culture that we're talking about, I mean, Elton, I suppose, is up there. Yeah. But the st- And the Stones. But the yeah. stamina, I mean, the, you know, well, the listen, stamina. Here's a controversial point of view. Everyone raving about Elton, who I love, who I went to see at Madison Square Garden for really? my 50th birthday. That's a Very great, kind that's of my a great way that to was celebrate great. it. But I was sitting there thinking, what's the difference between Paul McCartney and Bruce Springsteen and Elton John? Of course, Elton John didn't write any of the words to his songs. No. So I do not think Elton John is qualified to stand in that ultimate pantheon of rock gods because it's interesting, he, isn't he it? He didn't because write anything. When you were listening to all those, you know, amazing, you know, banger after banger after banger yeah. at the Glastonbury set, you're right. The music is magnificent yeah. and soaring. The performance is magnificent. But Everything. What makes Tiny Dancer is one of the, the greatest worst. songs of all time yeah. is Bernie Torpin's weird, ma- magical Absolutely. language, you know. The poetry Jesus it, freaks yeah. out in the street, yeah, handing tickets right. out to God. That's right. Where does that come from? That's right. Um, so, no, I agree with you. That's that's kind of a... Well, sadly, problem. we haven't had time to talk about any of that. Yeah. We must... Uh, we, must we must talk must about it sometime. Talk about it sometime. We must remit it, as they say in the Labour Party, <laughs> yeah. to another another occasion. <laughs> Brilliant. Remember, the latest edition of The New European is on the newsstands now, as well as on our website. There's got that uh, brilliant piece that we talked about at length in the first half by Giles Wilkes. And there's plenty more. Lots and lots of culture stuff in The New European every single week. And podcast listeners get a great deal on subscription. Head to theneweuropean.co.uk forward slash two mats. That's the number two, M-A-T-T-S. There's a link in the show notes. Just tell them I sent you. Thank you to producer Matt Hill at Rethink Audio, as always. And until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye.